my pleasure to welcome you to the 2021 Lawrence Brewster Lecture, sponsored annually by the Department of History and co-sponsored this year by the Thomas Harriet College of Arts and Sciences and ECU's chapter of Phi Kappa Phi. Before we get to our program, I'd like to read a land acknowledgement approved by the Student Government Association and the Faculty Senate. We acknowledge the Tuscarora people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live and recognize their continuing connection to the land, water, and air that Greenville consumes. We pay respect to eight recognized tribes, Kohari, Eastern Band of Cherokee, Alawasaponi, Lumbee, Meharan, Okanichi Band of Saponi, Saponi, and Wakamasuan, and their elders past, present, and emerging. The Brewster Lecture, which bears the name of the late professor of history, dates to 1983. That year, Arthur Link delivered the first Brewster Lecture, which was entitled Woodrow Wilson and the Revolutionary World. More recent lecturers have included Julian Bond, Andrew Zimmerman, Eve Trout Powell, Daniel Richter, Marcus Redeker, James McPherson, Barbara Harris, David Kennedy, Keith Waylu, and most recently, Laura Belmonte. We are honored this year to add the name of Nancy Shoemaker to that list. The presentation this evening is divided into three parts. In the first part, Dr. Shoemaker will give a talk outlining her current research. Next, a panel will offer some brief comments on the significance of her research. The panel will include Dr. Lynn Harris, Dr. Jason Rolp, and myself. They are faculty members in the Department of History and the Maritime Studies Program. In part three, we will open the discussion to questions from the audience. You may submit your questions by entering them in the Q&A function at WebEx, and you can do that at any time. Dr. Helen Dixon will be screening questions. Dr. Shoemaker received her PhD from the University of Minnesota. She is a professor of history at the University of Connecticut, specializing in American Indian history, maritime history, and environmental history. She has authored several books, including Native American Whalemen in the World, Indigenous Encounters and the Contingency of Race, published by UNC, A Strange Likeness, Becoming Red and White in 18th Century North America, published by Oxford University Press, and American Indian Population Recovery in the 20th Century. University of New Mexico Press. Please join me virtually in welcoming Dr. Nancy Shoemaker. Um, thank you. And uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, the uh, people who uh, on the Brewster Lecture Committee who invited me uh, and the panelists, uh, uh, Dr. Christopher Oakley, uh, Dr. Lynn Harris, and Dr. Jason Raup, and also to the uh, WebEx master, I guess we would call you uh, Dr. Dixon, uh, and also Jessica Kessler, who helped with the arrangements. Uh, I really wish I could be there. It is so disappointing, uh, because partly because I've never been there, uh, and also because uh, the North Carolina shore has a lot in common with the New England shore, especially in the frequency of marine mammal strandings, which is the subject of my uh, current book project. Uh, so I will uh, just begin. And uh, I, I do uh, really look forward to your questions and comments. So the whale commons, beached whales in New England history is the title of the book I'm writing. I'll start by explaining what I mean by whale commons and then focus on one chapter <clears throat> about how southern New England's indigenous people dealt with stranded whales in the 17th century. First, I want to set the stage with what I consider the most iconic moment in early American history. Typically, that would be the alleged first Thanksgiving feast shared by the Wampanoag and the English pilgrims who founded Plymouth Colony. My iconic moment is the so-called first encounter between these same people, which took place a year earlier in December 1620 on a beach in Cape Cod Bay 
at about where the arm-like cape bends at the elbow. The pilgrims had not yet picked Plymouth as the site of their settlement, and they were exploring Cape Cod Bay when, as they later recalled, they spied some 10 or 12 Indians very busy about a black thing. What it was, we could not tell till afterwards they saw us and ran to and fro as if they had been carrying something away. The black thing turned out to be a great fish called a grampus, another dead grampus, uh, lay on the sand and two more in the shallows. These grampuses were no doubt pilot whales, small black whales about 15 to 20 feet long, actually classed among the dolphins, which frequently strand several at a time or in larger groups, often at this very spot, such as the 59 stranded pilot whales at Wellfleet in 1982, 27 at Wellfleet again in 1991, 56 at Dennis in 2002, and so on. Today's marine mammal advocates and researchers are most concerned with the human causes behind whale strandings, ship collisions, and fishing gear entanglements. But beached whales have long featured in the daily life of people living along the New England shore from Eastern Long Island to Cape Ann. As stated in a federal report on the fishing industry from the 1880s, a Cape Cod fisherman occasionally wakes up in the morning to find two or three of these animals stranded in his backyard. Whale strandings were and are a common natural phenomenon in this region and involve not just pilot whales, but also right whales, fin whales, humpbacks, the occasional sperm whale, and assorted species of porpoises and dolphins. My project looks at how people responded to this phenomenon and how their response has changed over time. One obvious response is that the experience of witnessing and profiting from so many whale strandings laid a foundation for the emergence of the New England whaling industry, which from the 18th century uh, to the early 20th century was the largest whaling industry in the world. But the whaling industry is only one aspect of people's historical interactions with whales. My talk today deals mainly with the period before New Englanders started deliberately hunting whales from shore in the mid to late 17th century. So I like the tentative title of my talk, The Whale Commons, but I also have misgivings about it and would appreciate your feedback on whether to use this term. One potential problem is that the commons has many uh, contradictory definitions none of which match my usage. The phrase, the commons, dates to medieval England, but was ambiguous even then. It referred to the rights of all members of a community to share alike in certain environmental resources, or the rights of one class of people, the commoner class, uh, as opposed to the more elite landholding classes to use certain environmental resources. In both of these early English contexts, Common rights belonged only to people living within the same bounded territory and polity. Outsiders to these communities had no right to the commons. In the 20th century, the commons developed a more expansive definition and came to mean shared resources, regardless of territorial or political boundaries, as in the open access commons or the digital commons, and in arguments for the ocean or the atmosphere as a global commons that all of the world's people have rights to. In contrast, I see the commons as a perennial work in progress, a persistent problem that people have tried to solve in a variety of ways. Who has rights and responsibilities when it comes to managing the human relationship with the environment? New England whale strandings over a 500 year period from 1600 to the present are a perfect venue for studying how people have conceptualized the commons for several reasons. First, a beached whale straddles two dramatically different environments, land and sea. <laughs> Beaches are liminal spaces that cycle between these two states of being, changing from land to sea and back again. The question of who has rights and responsibilities for stranded whales is linked to this other enduring question about who has access to this unusual environment where land meets sea. <laughs> 
A second reason why stranded whales are a provocative focal point for thinking about environmental rights and responsibilities derives from how completely the human relationship to whales has changed over time. From 1600 to around 1900, those who found a whale on a beach considered themselves lucky. Whales were a providential bounty of natural resources ready to be transformed into items useful for human consumption. Beached whales were a windfall of food, oil, and raw materials for tool making. In the 20th century, beached whales became the opposite. First, they became smelly eyesores on tourist beaches and a burdensome garbage problem. Today, they are an environmental tragedy that involves hundreds of individuals, organizations, and government agencies in rescue efforts, and if dead, a burdensome garbage problem. A third and final rationale for focusing on stranded whales is that they enlarge the scope of environmental concerns, which typically emphasize resource scarcity and sustainability. The problem stranded whales represent has never been about scarcity. The problem with a stranded whale is one of abundance. In the 17th century, the sudden appearance of a whale on the beach provoked the question, who does this whale belong to? Who gets to share in this windfall? In more recent times, while whales may be considered scarce in the ocean, even just one whale on a beach is one too many. One of the main arguments in the whale commons my answer to the question, who has rights and responsibilities when it comes to managing the human relationship with the environment, is that people have persistently looked to government to regulate environmental access. The theoretical literature on the commons, most of which is not historical, but rather forward-looking and concerned with sustainability, understates the role of government. <laughs> Some of you are probably familiar with Garrett Hardin's famous essay, The Tragedy of the Commons, written over 50 years ago, yet still a touchstone for debating this issue. <clears throat> Using the colonial New England town green, a common livestock pasture, as his example, he argued that people left to their own devices would destroy the planet because they had an innate instinct to prioritize their self-interest over the well-being of the community. He ignored the fact that all communities, including the New England towns that he used as his example, uh, have never allowed individual self-interest to run rampant. All polities have rules and customs regulating how individuals use the environment they share. Another more influential, uh, another influential more recent theorist, economist Eleanor Ostrom also downplayed the role of government by celebrating the voluntary association as an effective environmental management system. Ostrom evaded the issue of how often the voluntary associations she studied relied on legislation and litigation to pursue their agendas. Because governments alone have the enforcement power to hold members of the community accountable, people endow governments with regulatory power over the commons and seek protection and restitution in disputes over property through governmental institutions. This was as much the case in 17th century New England as it is today, when the English began settling there, beginning with Plymouth in 1620, dozens of distinct polities of culturally related native people occupied distinct territories, each of which was ruled over by a sachem, if male, or a sunk squaw, if female. Thus powerful, Sachems and sunk squaws allied with more powerful sachems and sunk squaws for mutual protection in hierarchical confederacies. Over the 17th century, these confederacies splintered and regrouped. The arrival of the English and Dutch as possible alliance partners made realignment a tempting power play for some and a necessary survival strategy for others. Thus, the Montauket Sachem on Long Island owed allegiance to the Pequot Sachem in Connecticut until the 1637 Pequot War, when the Montauket Sachem Wyandanche shifted his allegiance to the English. The native people living on Cape Cod, Martha's Vineyard, and Nantucket belonged to the Wampanoag Confederacy, headquartered on the Massachusetts mainland at Montauk uh, near Narragansett Bay. <clears throat> 
1620, Massasoit headed the Wampanoag Confederacy. His two sons inherited the satchelship in secession. The youngest, Metacom, King Philip to the English, became more famous than his father as leader of the fatal war against the English that is named after him, King Philip's War of 1675, when the Wampanoag Confederacy collapsed. <clears throat> Although most sachems and sunk squads expressed fealty to the head of a confederacy, they still ruled over their own territory. Since Wales stranded mainly on the shores of Cape Cod, eastern Long Island, and the islands of Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket, the lesser sachems on this coastal periphery of these indigenous confederacies are of most interest to me. Such leaders as Wyandanche, the sunk squad, Wunatu Kwanuma, sorry, I knew I was going to get that one wrong. Wunatu Kwanumu, whose territory was on Martha's Vineyard, and Nikonus, an influential sachem on Nantucket. We know about these people and the nature of their authority as heads of government from two kinds of English records. English colonists wrote ethnographic descriptions of native societies, which are riddled with biases and have to be read, used with caution. Other types of English records, hundreds of property deeds, along with wills, estate inventories, and other kinds of agreements distributing rights to property, some of which were written in indigenous languages and dealt with property exchanges between native people, substantiate English descriptions of Wampanoag governance. One of the most complete descriptions of how Satcham ships worked comes from Matthew Mayhew of Martha's Vineyard writing in 1694. Like other English writers, he considered native New England governments monarchical and referred to the region's most powerful Satchams as kings, lesser Satchams as princes, and sunk squaws as queens. The eldest son, inherited the satchemship from his father, and if there were no sons, the position fell to a younger brother or daughter. Satchem's power was not absolute, since it was tempered by the need to appear uh, beneficent to their subjects and by a team of advisors they listened to for guidance. The satchem or sunk squaw received tribute or taxes in the form of animal hides and food from their people. They could call upon men to assist them in war, <clears throat> without having to pay for their service. And they granted those who wished to farm or hunt in their territory the right to do so. Their political authority extended over a broad range of environmental resources. And one can see from these records how one of the most important duties of the Sachem was to regulate the community's access to the bounty of the land and sea. One high profile expression of Satcham's sovereign rights was the right to all drift whales that landed on a beach in their territory. Drift whales is what the English at the time called stranded whales. According to Mayhew, Satcham's held rights to all wrecks of the sea, whales included. The prince, Mayhew wrote, was the absolute lord on the land and had no less sovereignty at sea. All belonged to him, which was stranded on the shore of his sea coast. So whatever whales or other wreck of value floating on the sea, taken up on the seas, washing his shores, or brought and landed from any part of the sea was no less his own. <clears throat> In hundreds of deeds recorded by English town clerks, the environmental management authority of Satchams and Sunk Squaws can be reconstructed as they use the form of the English deed to make bequests to loyal followers telling them where they could set up their wigwams, where they could plant their corn, allotting them rights to pasture livestock, uh, animals that the English had introduced into New England, allowing them to collect firewood and marsh grasses, and for the most high ranked of their followers, granting them a share in the Satchams or Sunk Squaws drift wells. Other kinds of deeds, the result of deals between Satchams and colonial leaders, further illuminate the variety of environmental resources that Satchams oversaw the use of. As they sold land to the English, they reserved use rights to these same resources, home sites, cornfields, timber, marsh grasses, and drift whales. <clears throat> One 1654 Cape Cod deed <clears throat> that handed over part of Cape Cod to Plymouth Colony, for example, spells out rights that the Satchams who signed the deed reserved. They could continue living 
where they then had their wigwams, cut firewood and beach grasses, gather berries, and, uh, quote, have such whales, blackfish, porpoises, and blubber as shall be cast on shore. As the historian David Silverman has shown in his research on Martha's Vineyard, English expansion eventually strained the Sachem ship and caused commoners to challenge Sachem's land sales as a violation of their right to a subsistence. English demands for land and other resources created tensions between Sachems and their people, suggesting that alienating the people's land, denying commoners access to a subsistence, was a government overreach that the people would not accept as legitimate rule. Even though Sachems and Sunk Squaws clearly held authority to distribute access to different kinds of environmental resources, their drift whale rights belong to a different category uh, from basic everyday resources. Drift whale rights were special and appear to have been most valuable as status symbols that spotlighted Sachem's preeminence as the community's sovereign ruler and embodiment of the people's identity as a sovereign community. In his key into the language of America, a highly informative close study of the Narragansett language published in 1643, Roger Williams included whales, patapuag, in his list of words translated into English and elaborated on native custom. Williams had himself seen some whales cast up, some measuring 60 feet long. The natives, he wrote, cut them into several parcels and give and send far and near for an acceptable present or dish. If you think back to the first encounter between the Wampanoag and Pilgrims, the English spotted the Wampanoag butchering a pilot whale into slabs to carry away with them. We do not know where those whale parts ended up. They were probably treated as food. More intriguingly, I suspect that someone took some of that whale to Montop as a present and political tribute to Massasoit. The specialness of drift whale rights is apparent in deeds where Satchams and Sunk Squaws made an effort to record their continuing rights to drift whales. I'll give a few examples. Shortly after the English purchased land from one Nantucket Satcham and established a town on the island in 1659, the English appointed two men to make a bargain with the Indians concerning all whales that shall come on shore on the island on the town's behalf. One assumes from this that they intended to acquire the uh, indigenous rights to stranded whales, but if so, they failed because 14 years later, the English on Nantucket acknowledged that all the whale fish or other drift fish belonged to the Indian sachems. Over the next decade, the English clerk on Nantucket recorded Satcham's bequests of drift whale rights to their relatives and friends and settled disputes between native claimants over stranded whales. In a 1677 deed, the Satcham Nicanus gave his brothers rights to certain territories within his own lands. This deed included the clause, if the whale shall happen to come ashore, that whale to be theirs also. That same year, the Nantucket court noted the boundary between the lands of two sachems, Spotso and Musaquat, noting what whales come ashore shall belong to him on whose right to the land it falleth. Two years later, the English court went so far as to rule against one of their own, Eliza Folger, for taking away the whale that rightfully belonged to Musaquat. As Satchams and Sunk Squads sold land to the English, they sometimes sold drift whale rights, but if so, usually only a share, preserving some portion of the whale for themselves. Uh, Wunatu Kwanumu sold two English settlers on Martha's Vineyard, a tract of shoreland lying in her dominion or Satchamship, with a provision specifying that if a whale were to come ashore, she and her heirs would receive one fluke or part of the tail one fin and one square yard of blubber. <clears throat> this could be considered both an interest in possessing part of the whale, but also a form of tribute demanded of the English she had permitted to reside within her territory. Rights to whales were not just about who got to consume the resource, but also manifested and affirmed the authority of sachems over their sovereign territory. <clears throat> 
Long Island deeds from the same time period, the 1650s through early 1670s, reveal a similar pattern. In 1658, Wyandotte Donch sold the beachfront from Southampton to what is now Mastic to his longtime English ally, Lion Gardner, in exchange for an annual rent of 25 shillings, uh, but asserted that the whales that shall be cast upon this beach shall belong to me and the rest of the Indians in their bounds as they have been anciently granted to them formerly by my forefathers. The next year, Wyandotte sold Gardner a different tract of land, this time allowing Gardner all the bodies and bones of all the whales that shall come upon the land, except for the fins and tails of all we reserve for ourselves, the Indians. The deed continues at length, spelling out the finer points of who got what, whether it was a whole whale or half or otherwise, whether it was four or five or 10 whales, and how much Gardner had to pay for the privilege. Wyandanch died soon after, but then his widow continued over the next decade to assert rights to shares of whales and payment for whales on behalf of their young son, Wyandanch's heir to the Satcham ship. These deeds in which the Satchams and Sunk Squaws signed away some drift whale rights give one clue to the value of native people attributed to whales. The fins, which was probably a reference to the baleen strips found in the mouths of baleen whales, and tails, or flukes, were clearly preferred over other parts of the whale. A 19th century descendant of Lion Gardner, in a romanticized eulogy for his ancestors' role in the English settlement of Long Island, claimed that the Indians wanted the fins and tails for heathen rituals. And this idea has somehow stuck around over time as though it has some veracity. It is perhaps true, but it seems more likely to me that either these were the most desirable parts of a whale in terms of edibility and tool making, or they were the most distinctive parts of a whale, making them the parts of a whale that could stand in for the whole. Since some of the rationale behind Satcham's whale rights was the whale as a symbol of the Satcham's distinctive social status within the community. This high regard for stranded whales probably had something to do with whales' mammoth size, the element of surprise inherent uh, with every stranding, and how a whale's presence on a beach made it a being out of place from the normal order. Whales were an unpredictable largesse emerging from the mysterious depths. For New England's English and indigenous people alike, stranded whales were providential gifts. And though the evidence is not straightforward on this point, the authority to rule in these indigenous societies and the phenomenon of whale strandings may both have been associated with divine power. Since this chapter is still in process, my analysis remains tentative, but I plan to develop two other points that will situate Satcham's drift whale rights within larger contexts. First, what I find remarkable are the par parallels to early modern English law and custom. What Mayhew described for indigenous monarchies in New England, that every wreck of the sea, including beached whales, belonged to the monarch or prince on whose territory it landed, is identical to English custom. This may be why the English colonists in New England so readily accepted the validity of Satcham whale rights and appear to have respected them as legitimate and comprehensible. Several hundred years before the English departed for the Americas, it was an established tradition that whales were royal fish, a royal prerogative that made them the property of the sovereign. A 1324 statute spelled out the law on this, and technically it is still in force in the UK today, though Queen Elizabeth II cedes her rights to royal fish to the British Museum and other scientific research institutions. The royal prerogative to claim all stranded whales when transported to the American colonies traveled different trajectories, but in the broadest, simpler ter simplest terms, still applied. Colonial governors of New York claimed that all drift whales belonged to the English crown and tried to tax them on Long Island and Nantucket, which briefly was considered part of the colony of New York. In contrast, the English charter granting Puritans permission to establish Massachusetts Bay colony explicitly transferred the right to all royal fish to the colonists themselves. When whales stranded on beaches claimed by English towns in New England, if no sachem claimed the whale based on ancient custom or reserved right, 
the town treated the whale as public property owned by all residents of the town who had equal shares in it. I believe that it is the liminality of beaches that make these spaces, spaces especially prone to be claimed as public space under the authority of the sovereign, whether that's the Sachem, monarch, or townspeople. A second related objective I have is to trace, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> a second related objective I have is to trace whale rights over time. Elizabeth Little and Clinton Andrews, the only scholars who've written about Satcham's whale rights at length in a 1982 article about Nantucket, stated that having reserved these rights, New England's indigenous people still have them. It is dramatic, however, how quickly the subject of Satcham rights to drift whales drops out of the documentary record. I do not know of any instance in the 18th century or later when any native person attempted to assert rights to drift whales. Whereas over the centuries, there have been many native land claims and attempts to reclaim use rights related to fish and timber. As an institution, Satchams and Sunk Squaws did not survive into the present, having been replaced in New England native societies by church deacons, town selectmen, and tribal chiefs. Another factor dimming the memory of Satcham's drift whale rights was no doubt the rise of shore whaling. Shore whaling began on Eastern Long Island in the mid 17th century and over the next 50 years expanded to include large operations on Cape Cod and then Nantucket. With English and native men looking out to sea from watchtowers, hoping to catch sight of whales, which they then chased in boats with harpoons and lances, fewer whales made it onto a beach of their own accord. And the disputes over whales that came to preoccupy New Englanders in the 18th century used a different property regime to determine ownership. It mattered less whose territory the whale landed on, if there were signs that the whale had been hunted, if for instance, it had a harpoon lodged in its side, it was an individual's labor and not a community's sovereignty over a stretch of beach that the local courts used to decide who had rightful possession. So to sum up, uh, as the English infiltrated the region, pressuring indigenous people to give up fields and forests to English control, Satchams and Sunk Squaws exerted great care to preserve their rights to drift whales. Though a single individual held this particular right, it was a sovereign, therefore collective right, embedded in the social and political fabric of the community. Statums used drift whales to convey their potency and beneficence, their rights to territory. Indigenous drift whale rights endured through most of the 17th century. In spite of disruptions caused by English colonization, the question remains as to whether New England, native New Englanders today could reconstitute the claims of their ancestors. So I will uh, yield the floor uh, to the panelists who are, are going to uh, give me some comments on, on the paper, which I, I sent them a week or two ago. Okay. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Shoemaker. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed um, your paper and um, reading your other research as well. Um, and I just want to comment that I think this is an incredibly valuable contribution um, to the scholarship on a number of themes, particularly, of course, the maritime history of Native Americans. Um, secondly, fisheries history, um, not only in southern New England, but also overall, uh, bringing in the diverse voices and traditions of Native Americans. And then thirdly, um, towards the end, addressing the colonial entanglements or engagements, the um, what I would um, maybe classify as an environmental history and perhaps extractive colonialism. We do colonialism, but what type of colonialism would this fit into? Um, so as a scholar, I think we're um, of maritime history, we're aware perhaps of the um, well boats offshore that you mentioned and um, overseas where they had enslaved uh, African Americans as well as Native Americans. Um, but the idea of the pre colonial traditions of whaling um, that you address is very interesting to me. And I thought 
Um, one of the most um, intriguing, compelling stories was the role of the um, leaders, both the men and the women, um, in the distribution of the um, whaling um, goods, um, and uh, also that this uh, allowed them to have um, a benevolence and a following uh, amongst their communities that empowered them. Uh, so once there was this colonial engagement, part of this, you know, the fabric of the socioeconomic um, leadership role with the community was um, to some extent weakened and, and diminished. Um, so th I, th I thought that was, uh, you know, a very important part um, of the, um, of the, you know, of the narrative. Um, and then also the the stranding, you addressed that briefly. I, I really would like to know more about that. But, you know, this, even though this was opportunistic, um, the idea that this could have had some divine um, implications um, further empowering um, the leaders. So that was, I think, the, you know, the pre-colonial aspect of whaling and drift whales in the culture. Um, secondly, um, just to address the, um, you know, the concept of extractive colonialism, um, where settlements, perhaps the early engagements with the coastal um, Native Americans uh, was not permanent settlement, but somewhat sporadic um, and exploitive, you know, whether it was, you know, other natural resources like uh, guano or um, uh, bison or, you know, gold, um, you know, how how did that impact the local societies? You know, to what extent, even prior to, to permanent settlements? Um, and um, another aspect that I think resonates with us perhaps later on was um, use of the indigenous inhabitants and perhaps their knowledge of, um, you know, the environmental knowledge that the, the colonials did not have, um, whether that was the whaling um, seasonalities when they when these drift whales washed up on the beaches, um, and then um, utilizing or engaging with Native Americans for their local knowledge um, of these, um, you know, to exploit these resources or mediation with their followers or other groups to, of course, the detriment um, of them. Uh, so. A couple of um, ways I think it contributes to the scholarship of, of ECU and, and the, myself and my colleagues are participating in would be, you know, North Carolina and South Carolina, the Eastern Seaboard, Native Americans were also frontiers men and women um, with knowledge of the estuaries of our coastline. They were maritimers, they made dugout canoes, um, they served as pilots um, through this very treacherous coastline. Um, and they also have had knowledge of, um, you know, mammals and other sea creatures that the colonists did not. And that included um, not only whales and porpoises, but also um, alligators and, and giant sea rays. And they're wonderful primary resources on, on how those, um, you know, engagements played out. But we've mainly looked at the historical period and, you know, based on your research, looking at that prehistoric engagement of the local communities prior to colonial settlement is seems vitally um, important. Um, another one that I sort of, uh, I think it could contribute towards is um, work um, that, that I've been doing in, in Central America um, with the mosquito harpooners of both manatees um, and turtles which was a huge industry with colonials but prior to that to, was also very much part of the fabric of their society following these creatures um, uh, along the seaboard um, and uh, understanding their natural habitats and how to hunt them which of course was exploited um, by numerous groups but particularly buccaneers or pirates um, where enslaved um, Mosquito Indians served aboard the vessels um, of several um, fairly prominent buccaneering groups. Uh, so uh, again, you know, how did this play out prior to these groups arriving and, and what was the knowledge and how did it change the fabric of these societies? And then lastly, um, I just want to mention, I think that um, there is an abundance of fisheries history in North Carolina, 
um, that is extremely valuable uh, to allow us to diversify um, our narrative about the groups, particularly Native Americans, um, who played a role in these fisheries, as well as Native Americans, whether it's shad, herring, menhaden, the porpoise industry. Um, and um, I think this will allow us to basically decolonize our um, syllabi um, and hear the voices of um, indigenous peoples and enslaved peoples um, more more readily. Um, and uh, I definitely, um, and I know my colleagues, uh, will value using texts such as yours and the approaches and their frameworks. I think this will be extremely valuable, um, not only in um, you know whaling and porpoise, but many other uh, fisheries industries uh, as well. Um, and I think I would like, on that note, turn it over to my colleague, uh, Jason Raup. Our, our Dr. Schumacher, I wanted to say thank you so very much for uh, for agreeing to to uh, to be the the Brewster lecturer this year. And um, I've I've had a long interest in your research, and and our research areas complement one another uh, quite quite nicely. Um, as a historical archaeologist, um, my research has really um, focused largely on the period of uh, the the mid 18th to the 19, uh, mid 19th century. So. Um, my early research, uh, I, it left me oftentimes with questions about uh, Native American involvement in this early period. So I think that the work that you're doing, your current research and your concept for a book is, is just, um, it's just spot on. It's really such a, a necessary um, gap that needs to be filled. So I really, I would really like to say thank you for taking that research up. I know that um, that this can't be, uh, you know, easy to try and dig through these archives to find this kinds of information. Um, but uh, I also wanted to make a few points, uh, as as did Lynn. Um, and I, of of the many different things that I found from your from your uh, discussion, I was really fascinated by this perceived association between the uh, Sachems and the uh, uh, Sansquas to the English monarchy um, and how that may have affected the ability for them to negotiate with colonists because I think in our sort of general history we we have this these ideas of uh, English colonists coming into the into the, the into the new world as it were and um, and just basically taking over and you know for for the price of trinkets you know suddenly but instead I think what you've what you're helping to do is Create a very nuanced understanding of um, of this the interaction between these cultural groups and and the political power with which they were able that that they wielded during this time. So I really I really found that fascinating, particularly with the idea that you bring up that uh, the the English the the long tradition of the English royal fish concept. Um, uh, you know, it it, it seems that. Uh, this is, I think, this was this is probably as fascinating to anyone in the in the audience as it is to me. Um, and secondly, I wanted to to touch on just the idea that as a whaling uh, historian and archaeologist, um, what I've found, and I think this is something you and I have discussed, um, is th the idea that with every with every um, avenue of research that you follow with whaling. You, you understand its connection on a much broader level to American history, be that uh, economic history or social history. Um, and uh, I think that this research is very anthropological in its approach. And I, and I just really wanted to say thank you for that, because I think at times it's, uh, it's, it's very refreshing uh, to, to read anthropological uh, approaches to to uh, to American history. Um, and then finally, I, I'll just follow up with um, Dr. Harris's comment about um, North Carolina's history. So North Carolina's uh, whaling industry um, is it developed in much the same way. Some of the earliest um, encounters or some of the earliest narratives of um, uh, of colonists along the coast and, and explorers to this region um, noted uh, beached whales or stranded whales 
And that, of course, became um, an impetus for the development of a, of a, a fishery in this area, which would later become known as the Hatteras Ground or the Hatteras Fishery. Um, and this is something that myself and some of our colleagues here are uh, currently developing a research project um, down around the Cape Lookout region, um, which was the hub of, of whaling uh, in, this, in this time. And it's just really interesting to see the, uh, the correlation between the, uh, the British, the development of the British um, whale or the colonial whale fishery in New England um, along this coastline. Um, however, the one thing that I've noted in the, in the preliminary research, and I'll, I'll admit that this is all very, very fresh and new, but is that we, we haven't really found much reference to indigenous involvement um, and certainly not indigenous uh, and, and certainly not um, uh, negotiation between the, uh, I think the, the first uh, land grant down in this area specifically focused um, towards whaling was around Harper's Island, and uh, that was in 1660. So, um, and from what I've seen so far, there's no indication of um, any interaction with, with local indigenous groups. So, I, I guess the point here is that I find that this research is going to be very, that your research is going to be, as Lynn, uh, Dr. Harris mentioned, uh, I think the research frameworks that you've developed are going to be very beneficial to us. So again, I, 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 I really like your research, but I've, I'm now realizing just how important that it can be um, that research along the New England coast is relevant to our local, our local uh, historical area. Um, and I, I don't want to take any more time, but I just wanted to say again, thank you very much. And, and I will now yield the floor to uh, Dr. Oakley. And uh, I look forward to talking to you to afterward. Um, thanks. Um, I would like to add my thanks to my colleagues, uh, for, to Dr. Shoemaker for giving us a preview of her forthcoming work. Um, and I'm honored uh, to offer some comments on her presentation. Dr. Shoemaker began by her, her talk by suggesting that we replace one iconic moment in American history, um, the first Thanksgiving, with a different moment, an early encounter involving Native Americans, English sailors, and whales. Thus, Shoemaker set the stage for both her talk and her book, which promises to make a significant contribution to several fields, including Native American history, colonial history, environmental history, um, maritime history, and what is actually an emerging new field, and that is Native American maritime history. She skillfully manages to take what might appear to some to be a minor question, who decides what to do with a beach whale, and turn it into a prism for examining a variety of very important historical questions, such as who has the rights and responsibilities when it comes to managing the human relationship with the environment, how did these change over time, and what is the legacy of Native American sovereignty as it relates to coastal resources. Next, Dr. Shoemaker offers a strong rationale for using the history of beached whales as a tool for analyzing the concept of the commons. Beached whales occupy an unusual geographical space, a transitional zone between, between land and sea, and thus present a distinctive case for studying this concept. She also contends that the human relationship to beached whales has changed over time. 400 years ago, finding a beached whale was a windfall of valuable resources. Later, stranded whales became a disposal problem, and today we view them as tragedies. Lastly, she points out that environmental concerns typically focus on scarcity and sustainability, whereas stranded whales create a different problem, one of abundance, whether that abundance is wanted or not. Dr. Shoemaker makes excellent use of deeds and other colonial records to answer her important questions. Historians who include Native Americans in their analysis, as all those who study early American history should, have long struggled with how to use written accounts that are obviously biased. Shoemaker's use, however, shows that it can be done and done well. In one of her more fascinating preliminary conclusions, Shoemaker argues that there were similarities between Native American and English practices regarding beached whales. In both cases, leaders controlled the distribution of the resources, but within constraints, 
This illustrated their power as well as the social and um, economic significance of the royal fish. Moreover, she contends that in both cases, people persistently look to leaders to regulate environmental access and obligations. This is an important conclusion, and it is one area where communication across cultures may not have been as problematic as in other areas. At the same time, Native American leaders never completely relinquished their claims to these resources, thus raising an interesting question about modern rights and how they may relate to Native American sovereignty. And finally, Dr. Shoemaker asked for feedback on perhaps the most pressing issue, the proposed title of her book. As I often tell students, and I hope some of them are listening, titles really do matter. In short, I like the title and I recommend keeping it, partly because it's catchy, which matters, but more importantly, it points to the broader significance of her book, especially how rights and environmental responsibilities have changed over time. The very notion of the commons is a contested concept, and her work historicizes that contest. I look forward to assigning the book in my future courses. With that, I will now turn it back over to my colleague who will moderate the question and answer segment, along with the assistance of Dr. Dixon. Okay, I, I see that there are several questions that have been uh, posed in the um, in the Q and A, but I would I was hoping that I might ask a, a very quick one. Um, in in your uh, talk, you mentioned the idea of um, whale flukes or tail as being um, in, in multiple uh, references as the um, as the tribute that is that is given. And I'm curious uh, uh, if if that. Um, that I cannot, if that, those symbols, um, certainly the whale flukes show up in, uh, indigenous iconography in the region. If you, if you have found that, if they, if that is not only just a tribute, but also something that is associated as a symbol of their status and power. Um, yes, uh, thank you, uh, everybody for those wonderful comments. Of course, it makes me wish I was there in North Carolina even more. Uh, to to learn more about these uh, possible comparative angles, which I think would be really helpful to explore. In terms of the uh, whale flukes, um, yes, that uh, there have been archaeological finds of uh, pendants and uh, also uh, fishing stone fishing uh, weights that are in the shape of whales, and these are either in the shape of whales or also the flukes. So, so that is uh, uh, something um, that I do mention sort of elsewhere in the book, but not in the talk tonight. Uh, so, so, but I, I should bring that in uh, to this particular point uh, about the sort of fins and tails uh, comment. I also just as an aside would say, uh, Dr. Raup, just as you were speaking there and we heard your feedback, I had this sense that these were like humpback songs. Uh, I don't know if your, your feedback sounds like a humpback uh, whale songs, uh, which seems very ironic, but. Uh, un unfortunately, I think that was probably just one of our local um, four wheel drive pickup trucks that drives <laughs> past our office all day long. <laughs> but but that's a curious uh, a curious uh, 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 analogy. Um, thank you. Um, I'm going to move over to the Q and A, and um, we have several really great questions. Um, if I can. So. Uh, I can see this here, so I, I could answer some of them quickly, maybe. Uh, okay. Noah's, for instance, Noah Edwards asks about, uh, I don't know, I assume everyone can see these, but yeah, how were infringements of on drift whale rights addressed between sachems or between sachems and the people they ruled over? Um, this is an interesting question because uh, we really only know about this um, from these English records when the English courts began settling their disputes. So before the uh, 
uh, why would the uh, Native Americans begin using English courts to do this is an interesting question. And what did they do before? Uh, so, uh, sachems were um, were expect they 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 did use uh, sort of physical punishment. Uh, uh, it, for people who did various infringements, uh, they, they could use violence. They could have someone else use violence uh, to uh, bring recalcitrant people back into line. And so I imagine, you know, some disputes were settled that way and some disputes probably were not never really settled. Uh, but it is interesting how on Nantucket in particular, uh, how extensively the uh, Indians on Nantucket turned to this English court system to resolve their internal disputes. Uh, and it's not just in the issue of whaling. Uh, Anne Plain's book on marriage also shows that there are a lot of uh, internal disputes that came before the Nantucket courts. Uh, so, um, Amber Kabading, if I'm pronouncing your name right. Yes, are whale strandings still uh, in, in modern memory? Yes, so I have another book that I edited, Living with Whales, which is a collection of documents, which includes some of these uh, deeds from the 17th century, but it also includes oral histories with uh, Shinnecock uh, and uh, Wampanoag people who are descendants of, of whaling families and uh, who still live on or near uh, these uh, communities today. And yes, they, uh, a lot of memory of this, as well as memory of their ancestors' involvement in the whaling industry as laborers uh, in the 17th, 18th, 19th, and early 20th century. Uh, so, if you go to any of these communities, Shinnecock particularly, and uh, Gayhead on Martha's Vineyard, or, or also known as Aquina, that, that memory of their attachment, their connection to whales and whaling history is very profound. Uh, in fact, some of them have asked me, or, or you know, or have raised the question of whether they do have rights. Uh, but the, I, ha I just don't know if they've asserted, you know, I don't know of anyone who's asserted rights, but it is something some of them have been thinking about. Um, That's fascinating. Um, so there's a, a question uh, by Danny Kruger that talks, that, that asks, why would the English uh, who were co coercing or forcing natives into giving up rights or territories not pressure them to give up the, their these rights as well, um, was it due to the custom of the royal fish? Um, yeah, so uh, I, I think that's possible. I think that uh, they though that they uh, could not pressure the natives to give it up because they didn't have the power to pressure the natives to give it up, and uh, you know they. You know, there's also this other question about, you know, how this is documented so well in the deeds that uh, actually, I think that might be one reason why the New England history is better documented that maybe in North Carolina, they just, you know, these Puritans uh, who settle Massachusetts are just so under record keeping, you know, that we have these phenomenal records for New England. Historians have known that for her you know, 200 years that the New Englanders and Massachusetts in particular just really like to put things down in writing. Uh, and so um, the, you know, the English also uh, are, they're constantly um, uh, confirming deeds that they've already signed. Like they think, you know, this is land deeds or any, any kind of property deed that they sign with uh, native communities. The English um, uh, often discover, you know, another uh, someone shows up and says, wait a minute, I'm the sachem of that territory and he had no right to sell that to you. So the English have to do another deed for that. And then the uh, Indians complain about um, uh, having not actually sold that land or because they expect this sort of annual tribute, you know, uh, payment or rent. Uh, and so the English do another deed. So you can kind of see that uh, in the 
process of creating deeds that the English really lack the power to force their will. Uh, you know, they, they don't have power demographically uh, over the native people, you know, until, you know, that just takes time. And um, once, you know, and that could also be another reason why the drift rail rights uh, kind of drop out of a documentary record uh, because the English no longer honor them. Uh, once they have power in the region, you know, particularly after King Philip's war in 1675. Yeah, this is all I, again, I think as your, your point uh, to, to your point about the, the, uh, the records that were kept. It's just a phenomenal, you know, uh, area of study. I think it's something we could all, everyone on this on this call, could spend a lifetime, you know, digging through these archives and finding some new angle. So it's uh, it's a testament to to those early record keeping uh, efforts by by the Quakers and and others involved in the in the early industry. Um, another another question that was asked by uh, Dr. Luskovich is. Uh, what was baleen used for? It, it's not an edible product, so uh, were there other products that Native Americans might have used it for? Um, yeah, so that's an interesting question uh, because I'm trying to, there are some decorative items uh, that have been found archaeologically that were made from baleen, but it could be that it was, um, you know, it's actually a little confusing in these 17th century records because the English at the time called baleen whalebone. Well, that is not very helpful if you want to know the difference between baleen and the skeleton or the bone of the whale. Uh, and so they might say something's been made from whalebone and you don't know if it was made from whalebone or baleen. Um, but, you know, baleen in, uh, you know, we know from how other people have used it around the world in you know later time periods uh that it, it you know it would be used uh back then by english and americans as um a substitute for plastic that we have today so it, it's this firm but pliable material uh so fishing poles uh umbrella rods uh corsets uh so I imagine that um, you know a lot of tools like that could be made from it. I'm not sure, um, Dr. Raup, maybe you would know this if baleen would not survive as well in an archaeological site as bone would. That would be my guess. Um, and, and so maybe that's why there just isn't as much of it in the archaeological record. I, I agree. I think that that's probably probably the case. Is it's uh, such an organic material that it would probably pretty pretty easily um, uh, dis disappear from the archaeological record. But and I, I myself, I've found no reference prior to um, you know again the, the buggy whips and the and the corset stays and the the plastic of its time. Um, I found I've never found any reference to to the use of baleen other than from uh, a ceremonial or a decorative uh, you know standpoint. So um, okay, I'm going to move on to the next question. I think some of these questions are great, and um, I'm really happy to see. And I think some of them are are being covered. But I think uh, Dr. Tim Jinks asked a question um, regarding if, if your uh, the kinds of archival records that you've been using to uh to explore this period of colonial history um yes yeah, so i'd have to say this was actually of course uh kind of a difficult situation that i would rather not have to admit though you'll all understand i could not go to the archives could i uh in the past year right so uh because i wrote though about whaling history and originally this was going to be part of my book uh that became native american whalemen in the world but as I was working on that book, I realized I just had so much on the 19th century. It was going to be a very weird book. Uh, and, and so I ended up concentrating on the 19th century. And then I did the document and oral history collection to cover the, the sort of uh, pre-contact uh, period up to the present uh, living with whales. Uh, and then now I'm returning to the uh, environmental history uh, material that I had collected uh, several years ago. So uh, 
I, I do have some archival materials. Uh, these deeds, you know, it's, it's these deeds have survived. I unfortunately uh, don't have the the Nantucket deeds and uh, had to it, it, because um, you know I haven't been able to go to the Nantucket deed office. You know, uh, it's closed. Uh, but and I didn't collect those before. Uh, but I have deeds about Nantucket that come from the Massachusetts State Archives that I got four or five years ago. There are lots of mentions in um, uh, there, are, you know, when you do the 17th century, it's uh, sort of a boon because a lot of the stuff has been published in printed format and usually in a pretty reliable sort of way. And uh, so there are some collections. I'd have to say for the Long Island material, you know, it's the town records for Southampton and East Hampton. And also, I want to give a shout out to John Strong, who has a wonderful book and uh, on uh, the whaling Native American whaling on Long Island, uh, and has been of great help to me and shared documents and collected a lot of documents. Um, so. Uh, for this part of the project, it is really these, these deeds that are very important and they uh, also, there's a, a collection um, of native writings in Massachusetts. It's called by Eve Goddard and uh, Kathleen Bragdon, who are linguists. And this is, they collected all of the uh, documents they could find that are written in the uh, native New England languages from this time period. And those that weren't translated by someone in the time period, they translated. And so that's a wonderful, you know, uh, two volume set. Um, and uh, because, you know, I, I don't know the native languages uh, myself. And so I've really relied on their translation. Uh, and so that has quite a few. There are probably uh, maybe five to 10 sort of mentions of, of drift well rights. Uh, in, in native language documents from this time period, some of which I are the ones I, I cited and referred to. Those were originally written in an English court record, but in the native language and then translated by the court clerk into English. That's, that's really fascinating. Uh, um, I, uh, Dr. Jinx had a follow-up question with it, but I, I feel like you covered that very well regarding deeds and, um, and uh, your access to digital resources and, and things. I think we all have, have known that in the last few years, it seems like daily new new things are being scanned and and uh, and, and accessible to us all from from archives. Um, I'll move on to the next question, which is from uh, Dr. Nathan Richards, um, that in which he says, uh, I, I recall the story of how Native Americans taught European colonizers about the use of pogies, moss bunkers, menhaden in agricultural practices, such as fertilizers. Are there cases of indigenous leaders asserting similar rights over the species of, uh, it, it, over species in New England? A fish for, uh, yeah, so, so that, that was sort of, a, that's one of these old chestnuts of early English Indian relations. I remember when I first got into this uh, field years ago, uh, there were various scholars uh, arguing about this point about whether the uh, Squanto uh, and other uh, New England natives taught the English colonists how to use fish as fertilizer. Um, whenever any issue gets uh, really debated like that, I tend to actually avoid it. Like, uh, you know, you end up getting two sides and they're all very adamant about the, their being right. And, and I, I, I usually just don't have an opinion on it after a while. So that's like the population of, uh, of Indians in 1492, huge contentious fight. I, I don't have an opinion. Uh, so um, I did want to address the issue. I think it was uh, uh, Lynn who raised this. Um, yeah, Dr. Harris, I think about the learning, you know, uh, how to learn a resource uh, in this sort of extractive colonialism. And I was thinking there that that does seem a related question. And I, 
kind of mentioned this a little bit in Dr. Raup's class this morning, but uh, uh, you know, there's no evidence that uh, southern New England Indians whaled, you know, deliberately hunted whales before uh, the English kind of fomented this industry in the 17th century. Uh, but the one thing that I, I thought the uh, Indians did know was where the whales were, uh, what time of year they're likely to strand, uh, because some of these are seasonal in certain places, uh, and also how to butcher a whale. Uh, unfortunately, you you don't you won't uh, you'll have to wait a few years for this book to come out. But the next chapter is quite fun because it's. Uh, actually about how the English adapt to stranded whales. And it's just uh, amazing records because, uh, and this is why I have rights and responsibilities in the title, because these English towns uh, end up kind of requiring all the men to go out and butcher the whale. And they, they have all these rules and they're trying to get these people to go and cut up the whale uh, that belongs to everybody in the town. So it's a kind of classic commons dilemma where you have these so-called free riders, you know, people who don't want to do the labor, but who want to profit from the system. And you see these English towns struggling to get uh, these people to comply with their obligation to go butcher the whale. And uh, Lion Gardner, um, uh, who's this sort of a liege on Long Island that I mentioned, who acquired these uh, land rights from Wyandanche, um, he and the minister of East Hampton, uh, they actually buy their way out of this obligation by offering to provide everyone liquor. So they're kind of these elites, they bring the alcohol, but everyone else does the dirty work, you know, of cutting up the whale. Uh, so it's, it's um, you know, definitely there's evidence of the English colonists who are completely befuddled by this phenomenon, you know, at first. So this is just an amazing thing to them. It's not something they're used to in England because most of them come from the interior. Uh, so they do, they do learn about whales in that sense. They learn about stranded whales uh, a lot from the native people. I think that's a that's that's excellent. Um, that that idea of the commons that you you brought up early in your talk, I really think that is that's such an important concept when it when it comes to this this period in which the if if a, a whale was stranded and, and it, no right was asserted by the sachem that they uh, that the township would give an equal share to everyone. And, and I found references to the same that uh, they did struggle to try and get everyone to contribute their, you know, to the labor um, mm -hmm. and then eventually to also contribute to um, their their involvement on the boat crews. Um, you know, so which became these townships, you know, ways of of actually uh, harpooning and in, in the shore whaling you know tradition so um and I, I i think there's a question by dr jonathan reed that um talks about uh the native americans engage in whale hunting prior to the arrival of europeans and i feel like you really have kind of covered that in in your response there it's something we talked about this morning in that there's it seems to be uh this traditional view that native americans would have been good harpooners and i think that's a a, a racist stereotype that was probably as, as, ascribed to Native Americans for one reason or another. Um, and certainly it seems to have limited and, and your, your excellent research uh, on, on Native American involvement on whaling ships um, in the 19th century is, is, is a great evidence of that and their, their ability to rise through the ranks to a point, um, you know, and, but that they are seen as great harpooners rather than and and it's this uh, perhaps this thought that that well surely they whaled prior to uh, to English colonists uh, arrival, but the fact is there's no great evidence that shows that. So um, so I think that was a that's a great question, Dr. Reed, and and uh, I think again some of these questions seem to really be blending in a great way. So um, I want to move to a question by Dr. Uh, Kirsten Squint that uh, says, thank you for your fascinating lecture. And I, I have a non-maritime question for you. Um, a couple of weeks, in a couple of weeks, Choctaw author Leanne Howell will be speaking at ECU and I teach regularly, I regularly teach her essay, The Story of America, a tribalography. Um, 
which you published uh, in, in your collection, Clearing a Path, almost 20 years ago. Since then, Howe's theory of tribalography has become a methodology for textual analysis in indigenous literary studies that has gained traction in the last decade. Do you anticipate anticipate the inter, this interdisciplinary impact? This did you inter, uh, anticipate the interdisciplinary impact that this essay would have? Sorry, it's a bit of a long question. Um, yeah, actually, uh, I, I just can't believe it's been twenty years. I guess that's the the first response I have to that question. Has it really been twenty years? Uh, so Leanne Howe and I met years ago before she became this famous uh, novelist, playwright, and scholar. Uh, we were part of a, a seminar for eight weeks uh, in Oklahoma on ethnohistory. Absolute wonderful person, uh, dynamic, charismatic, smart speaker. You, you will have a great time. I'm so glad she's coming to ECU. I have not seen her. It, it, for 10 years, maybe five years at least. Uh, so I'm just so glad to hear she's visiting you. Uh, just one of the most wonderful people in the world, I think. Um, and so, yes, that that article uh, really did her article on tribalography, which uh, I published. Uh, I, I think it just really did provide a vision for uh, a sort of indigenous perspective on you know, how you uh, particularly, I think, trying to meld this uh, dichotomy uh, that's really prejudicial in its foundation that somehow science is uh, European and uh, native people have culture. And so kind of trying to show uh, the intellectual thought of, of native people uh, and, um, uh, so, so to get away from that dichotomy, that's kind of very related to the uh, harpooner kind of prejudice. This idea that somehow there's, in, uh, you know, uh, Native people are ruled by instinct and Europeans by the mind, uh, by rationality, and I, I think that really infuses a lot of uh, historic writings about Native people produced by Europeans and. I, I think uh, Leanne Howe's article is just a beautiful sort of turning that on its head in lots of ingenious ways. That's a great response. We um, we see with cultural heritage that that you know the um, the rise in interest in traditional ecological knowledge and you know more of a, a an, an an appreciation I think for the intangible and for the this uh, scientific mind of of everyone uh, you know of indigenous people so uh yeah i i, I look forward to dr howe's um, talk um and and there's one last question from uh dr larry ties um that uh in north carolina in north carolina's colonial period lawmakers carefully prescribed indian fishing rights in estuary streams and rivers was that also the case in new england uh, yes, so uh, one of the uh, major, when I mentioned at one point that there were uh, claims to land and fish that were quite common, uh, you know, there have been lots of claims by tribes to uh, shellfish, uh, you know, oyster banks, clam, clam banks, um, I guess they're not really called oyster banks, are they? But clam banks and uh, the, uh, and particularly also the um, fish, like the herring, you know, that uh, herring runs are just such a kind of seasonal importance. And the Mashpee Wampanoag on Cape Cod, for instance, uh, have spent uh, a lot of their resources in the 19th and 20th century trying to assert their rights to uh, these sort of fish that run upstream and of course the and downstream uh, but the uh, you know the, they they get caught up in the uh, uh, anyhow that's a particular right that New England uh, Indians tribes have asserted and in some cases successfully 
Uh, there was one question that I think that I must have missed by Dr. Randy Daniel. Is there archaeological evidence of whale remains in Native American sites, uh, either as food remains or bone artifacts? And, and I would follow with this with your research on whale meat, um, an article that we discussed earlier today. That might be a really great way to, to talk about it. So I know you're not an archaeologist, but um, just the, the, the use of Native Americans uh, or Native Americans use of whales uh, for any number of things. Yes, so archaeologists in New England have found uh, whale remains in archaeological sites, particularly in shell middens, right? These are the sort of coastal uh, trash dumps, or the trash dumps for coastal people. Uh, so a lot of uh, shellfish shells uh, showing that that was a food staple, uh, but they've also found, you know, skeletal remains of whales. Um, now, that doesn't really, though, tell us much about how they were using them. Uh, I think that they were food comes from more these other kinds of records. Uh, and that would be the example I gave from Roger Williams, who said they sent them as a, a gift, a present, a, a, a dish. So clearly, in, in 1643, uh, they were eating the uh, whale. Uh, because they were sending it as a dish of food. Uh, but also there's um, a well-known, some of you may be familiar with it if uh, or run across this, but the uh, Gayhead people on Martha's Vineyard, uh, the Gayhead Wampanoag, uh, they have a folk hero, Moshap, who is uh, 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 very connected to whales in lots of ways. Uh, he's a giant who uh, roasted whales and ate them. And there's, um, historically, uh, there's a pile of whale skeletons or there are various spots around New England where they seem, they seem to have piled up. And uh, so possibly because these were stranded whales or dump sites or, but also um, I think uh, the, there are descriptions of using the, like the whale vertebrae as seats, you know, chairs, furniture, that seems quite common. Uh, yeah, but it really is scraping together to kind of get a full picture. It really means scraping together a little bit from here and a little bit from there. Uh, uh, I understand. I, I was thinking as, as you were talking about um, uh, in, in Australia that the use of um, by, uh, by historic, by, by whaling, uh, bay whalers and shore whalers, a uh, whale vertebra for um, they're, they've ex, uh, excavated um, whalers' huts there, and they found that entire floors have been paved with whale vertebra, and um, they oh, found uh, you know vertebra that have uh, had holes you know drilled into them so they could make seats out of them and things. So certainly, I you know as with anything, it's just such a um, a, a useful, uh, large useful you know <laughs> objects that it's it's pretty easy to see that. Uh, uses there. I just personally don't have as much knowledge of the, the prehistoric uh, context. So. Mm -hmm. um, yes, Arche I could just also add archaeology. Archaeologists have also found at least one instance, maybe more of uh, whale bone, meaning the whale skeleton, uh, being uh, uh, what appears to be like a flensing station. Or, But it's, sometimes it's a little hard to know if this is uh, before. Uh, you know, uh, if this was sort of indigenous or if it's the very early shore whaling uh, that was uh, a kind of hybrid activity between the English and the uh, native people. Uh, the, the last question I see is by James Phillips, and it's uh, are most of the archival sources you draw upon legal documents dealing with the beached whales or are there narrative accounts as well? And I know you did touch on um, some Native American language uh, documents. So maybe you could explain a little bit more about that. Yes, they are mostly uh, legal documents uh, that uh, relate to this property dispute or to uh, the, the sort of cases that came before the uh, colonial courts and, and were recorded. But there are also uh, some narrative accounts of, uh, you know, people like John Winthrop who mentioned things like a, a whale stranding or, you know, there, it's just, um, 
it is like what you had said earlier, Dr. Rao, that it's a needle in a haystack kind of research because, you know, whales, uh, a lot of people, indexers have never been interested in them. And you would, you know, it, it's just that often whales does not appear in an index, even though it's mentioned in the documents that somehow it doesn't register as a subject uh, uh, to a lot of people. And uh, so, um, it's it's hard uh, to come across it. Now, on the other hand, my my book is does have a large scope because you know it starts around 1600 and it's going to end with the present day. You know, with save the whale types of activities uh, and um, all the organizations involved in this, NOAA and, and other groups that uh, have uh, stranded whale networks, whale watching. So. It, you know, if it's covering such a long period of time, uh, and actually each chapter requires using different records, uh, I guess this is my excuse for saying that I'm not going to spend three years uh, leafing through the 17th century uh, documents and archives. Uh, so it's going to be more strategic. I think the best examples are uh, the best material has already is, is usually out there already. Someone's mentioned it. Uh, and so it's it's more targeted research on my part uh, of piecing together um, that. Whereas I think the 20th century, uh, you know, the, the chapter I'm I really I think I'm going to enjoy writing is the one where the uh, whales become a garbage problem and where everyone just um, doesn't like the smell and it's really interesting because they uh, there are just oodles of postcards of Cape Cod beaches. Show it like in the uh, promo or the flyer that you had at the start of the talk here. Uh, these are there are just hundreds of these. You can I, I've been buying some on eBay to build up my own collection, and it's very interesting to see people's comments. Uh, you know when they if they're a postcard that they actually sent. You know and why did they pick out this picture of this you know big dead whale? But there are lots of comments of the stench. Uh, it's a problem today when a whale strands, uh, the states apparently have very different rules about whose responsibility it is to remove the whale from the beach, you know, the carcass from the beach. Um, so I think uh, that actually is going to be harder research because no one's really looked at that at all, uh, so far as I can tell. And so even though it's 20th century, it's, it's going to be trickier. So I lost you, Jason. I think I'm back now. Uh, okay, there you I, are. I, I, that your your concept of the 20th century whale problem is is really fascinating to me, and it's something that came up a point I didn't make earlier. But um, how we uh, I think we lost you, Nancy. Uh, oh, I'm still here. Okay, you're back. Um, but <laughs> just uh, I think when we I think. Probably most people, when you think of um, beached whales or stranded whales, you know they go to the YouTube video of the uh, the attempts to blow up whales and things like oh, that. Yeah. So this is really given some context, and I think it's it's really great that the book that the book that you're planning will actually cover that because it shows a real broad spectrum of the value that's placed on whales at a time and how marine resources can be extremely valuable in the you know in the case of whales when they were as valuable as gold in into the in the american economy and and now they're nothing but a nuisance and something that becomes you know an issue that you spend money to 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 sort of dispose of so um i, I really am looking forward to this book because i think it's going to span that time and it's going to be great so um so well, it's true. I actually i was just reminded of this book uh, about children you know how children used to be productive uh, contributors to the household, uh, but then in the 20th century, they became complete consumers. They're just the, the big consumers of the household wealth uh, in the uh, United States, at least. And uh, I guess you could say the same thing about whales. Yes, they're part of the productive economy, the wealth producing economy, but now they are a complete like consumption item because uh, uh, they, it's just unfathomable how much these rescue efforts cost and how much um, how many people get involved in these who volunteer their time the government agencies the scientists who are doing the autopsies uh, 
the, the bulldozer guy who comes to cart it away. Uh, and um, it's, uh, it's a huge, all the efforts uh, being put now into trying to save uh, the few remaining right whales. A uh, huge amount of money uh, that is, is going into protecting right whales and uh, also uh, in terms of laws and policies to protect them uh, from uh, entanglement and uh, ship collision. Uh, and so they, they have become sort of, it is a complete reversal. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's fascinating. It's something we touched on earlier is the, the idea that the tourist industry that now exists around whales, um, you know, in so many places, but, you know, for instance, in, uh, in Cape Cod, um, and how there are calls to stop those industries because of their, they're seen as harassing whales and, and, you know, it, it, because there are so few, you know, um, despite some populations, see, we're seeing, you know, a rebound in some populations, but certainly the right whale, it, it, it's no longer uh, targeted uh, destruction, it's inadvertent destruction through, you know, marine activities uh, by humans. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's just such a, it's such an interesting topic that you, that you found. Um, there's one other question by Dr. Ties that uh, are there, are there Indian oral history and are there an Indian oral history and concept of human contacts with whales like Jonah and, and the whale or encounters with great dangerous fish and the Grampus and, and that? Um, yeah, so there is of, this, uh, the Moshop uh, folk hero that I kind of briefly mentioned. Uh, and so there are maybe, uh, there are lots of different accounts of, of him, uh, this giant who, who lived uh, at the Gayhead Cliffs and uh, he's sort of a, a creator of the landscape, created islands, uh, created killer whales by his children become killer whales. And so there's just a lot of lore there that continues uh, at the uh, Quina Wampanoag community today. Um, and uh, so it's interesting, though, that that's really kind of the only place, you know, why it is, for instance, the Shinnecock, who also live right on the ocean on Long Island, uh, didn't have a similar folk hero develop. I don't know, but it, it really is mostly just this one community on Martha's Vineyard uh, that has a rich tradition. Thanks. That's that's great. I, I know from. Um... You know, my research in, in the Pacific and in Australia, there are certainly whales become prominent in sort of supernaturalism. And, mm -hmm. and so um, so there are similar stories. Um, so m maybe that's the next book, I guess. You know, so. Yes, no, I've heard <laughs> of that, of uh, uh, Australian Aboriginal stories about whales. Uh, I've, I've, people have mentioned that to me, so though I'm not yeah. familiar with them, but. Um, well, I. I guess I would, uh, I guess that's the last of the questions from our audience, but I do have one that I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you. Sorry, as an archaeologist, um, you mentioned in your talk that uh, uh, Satchams held uh, rights to all wrecks of the seas, including whales. Do you know of any instances in which colonists negotiated with Satchams or Sanskla's uh, uh, regarding shipwrecks or associated materials or possibly even sailing ships? Yeah, so there certainly are shipwrecks. Uh, that's, that's in fact this thing that uh, the Cape Cod area and the Cape Hatteras area really have in common. <laughs> they are dangerous places for uh, marine mammals and for ships. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, that's a really interesting question because I'd have to say I can't recall you know, the only time I can recall uh, Indians coming up in the context of shipwrecks is because they are the ones who saved the people uh, who were wrecked. Uh, and um, this is in the, you know, 17th century, and there's even a famous shipwreck city of Columbus uh, where gayhead Indians who were former whalemen uh, were the ones who, who rescued, who went out in like a, a boat to rescue the people on this uh, passenger vessel. Uh, as many as they could, even though a huge number of passengers died. Uh, so uh, now whether, 
uh, I will throw in something kind of off the wall. You know, I, I tend to do kind of, I guess, off the wall topics like whale meat and stranded whales. And uh, I, my most recent book is actually on Americans in 19th century Fiji, which came out of this whaling project. And um, what's interesting there is that they also have the same uh, rule, the, the same law about wrecks of the sea. Uh, and there it, it really did apply to shipwrecks and that creates a huge problem for the American uh, traders who were there, or eventually for British, uh, the British eventually colonized Fiji. Uh, and they tried to, uh, the leaders there are called Taranga, they tried to get the, um, the rights of the Taranga to this wreck of the sea that lands on their territory. Uh, and there they have a right to kill, they had a right to kill them as well, you know, if any survivors. Um, were on shore, they were also the, the property of the, the sovereign. Uh, so, and I also heard a paper at this uh, whaling, Pacific Whaling Conference I was at a few years ago that I mentioned to your class this morning. Uh, one of the papers was on stranded whales uh, in, this, uh, in this area inhabited by the indigenous people of Japan. Uh, and it was strikingly similar there as well in terms of these claims to who owns it being being attached to uh, territorial claims. Uh, and um, so I think I got off topic there, but uh, you'll, you'll have to remind me what your question was. But <laughs> I think it's okay. I, I think it was just uh, my, my question related to, to Rex, but I think you answered it perfectly. And I think, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting to think of uh, how we, we bring that discussion of um, ja strandings in Japan and the, and the fact that the Japanese are, have a long tradition of consuming whale, whale meat. Um, so you can see how that would be, um, that would be a very uh, you know, contentious topic as to who might take ownership of, of something that is seen as uh, you know, unlike what we see in, in uh, in New England or in North Carolina, where the whale isn't necessarily uh, harvested for uh, for for food, uh, possibly in Japan, but also you you mentioned this morning that there's beautiful traditions of carvings and things on um, on whale bones. So um, so as a as a source of of raw, raw material for art. Um, yeah, so in terms of the uh, anyhow, I will have to keep my eye out for that in terms of the. Uh, whether there were other wrecks of the sea, you know, I, I just can't think of any example at the moment from the New England, the early New England uh, documents of that being an issue. Uh, as I said, it seems mostly to be uh, a matter more of Indians saving these people's lives because they were on the verge of drowning. Um, okay, um, it looks like we have uh, one, uh, not so I guess uh, we've, we've really gone well and truly past the time that we've asked you to uh, to answer questions Nancy and and I so I at this point I don't know if, if Dr. Oakley if you'd like to uh, to weigh in uh, to close um, I certainly want to say thank you very much for um, for answering so many questions and, and giving us so much of your time um, I, I really hope that we can get you down to uh, to North Carolina and uh, to down to ECU um, sometime soon. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'll just add my thanks to Dr. Shoemaker and to all the panelists and all the attendees. And you have an open invitation to jump in any time. So if you're, even if you're just coming down here to vacation, it's not a, not a very uh, far trip from the Outer Banks or the, the coast to here. So please, please come visit us. Um, we'd love to have you on campus and thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you very much. It's, it's really been wonderful uh, meeting you and getting your feedback. And with that, we can um, wrap it up. Um, thanks to all.